Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, it's a pleasure to be back uh, in Trieste. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak, and also uh, for not scheduling my talk uh, first thing in the morning. Um, so the subject of what I'm going to talk about today um, is easy to describe in words. Um, it consists of um, two compact stars, black holes or neutron stars, um, still far apart um, in orbit around each other, interacting gravitationally, uh, and in the process emitting gravitational radiation. Um, in Newtonian gravity, this is a freshman physics problem. These things just go around and around forever and ever, as, as long as they're sufficiently far apart. But in GR, um, all hell breaks loose, and this is a nonlinear problem, uh, and it's in fact a research problem. So my goal is to describe uh, the dynamics of the system, at least in a certain regime, uh, using methods uh, borrowed from particle physics, namely, uh, or, and statistical mechanics as well, namely uh, the concept of an effective field theory, which I will review um, in this lecture, or I will introduce in this lecture. Um, so first of all, let me um, start by introducing the scales in the problem. So I'm going to be talking about compact stars or compact astrophysical objects. And what I mean by that is that um, the size of the star, if it has a well-defined size, let's call it the physical radius, um, is um, of order or only slightly larger than the gravitational radius of that object. So if this is a system, if this is a, an object with some mass m, the gravitational radius, um, I'm going to call it gravitational radius, but it's also just the Schwarzschild radius of the system. Um, and so that's 2 times uh, Newton's constant times the mass. So by compact, I mean an object whose actual radius is of order that size. And uh, the units are uh, C equals 1. Uh, so certainly a neutron star, for example, with a mass um, close to the mass of the sun and a radius of order um, 10, 20 kilometers or so, um, sat, um, is a compact object because, um, uh, because in, um, in these units, in gravitational units, this is something like a kilometer or so. So the Schwarzschild radius of the sun is a kilometer. So we're talking about an object whose radius is close to the Schwarzschild radius. And certainly for a black hole, these two scales coincide. What I mean by the size of a black hole is just its Schwarzschild radius, its gravitational radius. So uh, these are the objects that I'm going to consider. And what we're interested in is in the gravitational wave emission from, um, so first of all, a system of one object, isolated object, is stable. It just stays like that forever. So, um, um, so what I'm really going to be interested in is in dynamics. So I have to have at least two. And two is hard enough. So let me just do two and not do the three-body problem, et cetera. So um, what I'm interested in is in describing gravitational waves from uh, binaries um, consisting, uh, consisting of compact objects. So, um, so this is, in a cartoon, the problem that I want to solve. Let's focus on the case. Most of my lectures will be about black holes because they're cleaner. It's a purely gravity problem as opposed to neutron stars that have all sorts of other physics in them, nuclear physics, et cetera. So let's just focus on uh, the black hole case. And so what we want to solve is uh, we have a black hole here, black hole one. Um, it's tidally distorted by the presence of a second black hole here. The whole system is emitting gravitational radiation uh, with some frequency spectrum omega. And I have um, a gravitational wave detector way out here on Earth. 
Um, and so what I want to know is what the spectrum of gravitational waves looks like way out here. So um, near the system, um, this is some solution of the Einstein equations. Uh, and let's imagine that we know the metric. Then to know um, the experimental observables, all that we have to do, um, at least in the black hole case, is solve uh, this equation. Ricci curvature equal to zero, subject to some initial conditions. And then if we want to know the experimental observables, all we have to do is take that solution and um, take the limit where we're really far away from the system of emitting black holes. And if we pick smart enough coordinates, uh, the metric out here looks flat plus a small piece. And then this small piece is what gravitational wave detectors measure uh, way out at infinity. So what we want to calculate is that. And then there's going to be some, some spectrum of gravitational waves. So we could also do this in frequency space just by taking the Fourier transform. in some suitable coordinates that go to flat space coordinates out at infinity. That part is important. So that's the goal. So it's a pretty simple goal if you uh, think about it. But of course, um, the question is, how do we do this? Some non horrible nonlinear partial differential equations. And so the question is, how do we solve it? Well, um, the first thing that we notice is that these equations are actually scale invariant at least in the case where we're talking about black holes and we're just solving the vacuum equations. Where's the eraser? Because um, they're scale invariant because um, if I rescale the metric by a constant, so if you take the metric as a function of x, and uh, you rescale them by some constant. Um, these equations stay the same. So the only thing that this problem can depend on um, is uh, this scale, the, the gravitational radius, and the frequency of the gravitational waves. So what determines the form of the spectrum is uh, the following parameter, just by this sort of scale invariance. Some parameter that I'm going to call epsilon, which is um, a dimensionless parameter. And so if you take the short shell radius, what I'm calling RS is also what I'm going to call RG. So I use both uh, um, interchangeably. So this is the parameter that um, describes the physics. So this is, uh, I don't know, the, this is what determines the shape of the spectrum of waves. Uh, the distance is, you mean, to the source or between them? So um, in the nonlinear regime, where these things are very close to each other, that's not a very meaningful quantity. We'll talk about the distance soon. But in the nonlinear regime, it, that, that, that's not a meaningful scale, right? Because these horizons could be merging or something like that. Uh, but uh, in some regime, that certainly is a meaningful parameter. So I will talk about that in more detail. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is the parameter that determines the qualitative features of the spectrum. So we can talk about the different limits. Um, we can talk about the limit where uh, the uh, f where this parameter is of order one, and therefore uh, the spectrum of waves, or sorry, the wavelength of the waves is of order uh, one over the short, it's of order the short shell radius. And that's what's called a nonlinear regime. And that's a hard problem. So uh, the nonlinear regime is where this epsilon is of order one. 
Um, if that's true, then that means that the typical wavelength of the gravitational waves that I'm looking at, divided by the gravitational radius, is of order one or maybe a little bit larger. Um, and so in this limit, these two black holes are close together, so this is exactly the limit where uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about a separation between them. It's some horrible nonlinear problem. Um, and, in that, um, and in that limit, um, in that limit, um, we're kind of stuck because um, the way I know how to solve physics problems is either to uh, use symmetries, there are none in this problem, or to have some small expansion parameter that I can use to do perturbation theory in. There isn't one here. So uh, this is um, not tractable by pen and paper. I'm a pen and paper kind of guy. Um, so instead, you need to use um, a supercomputer. And I don't have one of those. So I'm not going to talk about that limit. Um, yes? It's because, um, it's because the, these gravitational waves have a radius, which is a word of the gravitational radius. So the gradient energy in them is of order of the energy of the system. So um, if you like every, you can't expand Einstein's equations in a small, uh, you, you can't expand them around flat space. That limit doesn't exist in this case. So it's, not, it's just not a useful limit. Or it's not a tractable limit. So anyway, so that's the supercomputer regime uh, for most of the time that the system spends uh, in this parameter range. Um, for most of the time that it spends in that parameter range, meaning that I can look at uh, this nonlinear system. So here's, uh, once again, the two black holes very close to each other tidally distorting each other's horizons, et cetera, emitting waves. Um, and this regime is called the merger because these things eventually, well, they're unstable to emitting gravitational waves, so they eventually collapse into each other. So they merge, and then they merge into some object. And if what we understand about GR is true, what they merge into is a black hole because it is, even though not proven mathematically rigorously, it is widely believed that the endpoint of gravitational collapse is a black hole. And it's not going to be a black hole that's going to be in its ground state, if you like. It's going to be highly perturbed. Uh, so it's still going to be emitting away most of its multiple moments. Uh, and that phase is called the ring down. The process of doing that is called the ring down. And eventually, if, again, if everything we know about GR is a guide, what it settles down into is a black hole. So the endpoint of this collapse is a very simple object. It's just described by two numbers, the mass and the spin. And it's stable. So the nonlinear regime is when the two things are colliding, uh, supercomputer time, uh, they merge. This part, actually, you don't need a supercomputer for. This part you can actually solve uh, using the methods of what, are, what is called uh, black hole perturbation theory. Black hole perturbation theory is just the, um, I don't know, the, uh, the uh, enterprise of um, expanding uh, uh, the Einstein equations around the black hole solution. So the, the ring down is um, tractable um, semi-analytically, meaning that it's, uh, you can turn it into first order differential equations that you can then solve on the computer. So the ring down just consists of expanding the metric around the metric of an isolated black hole plus uh, the fluctuations, the thing that it gets radiated out to infinity. And then uh, the fluctuations obey a wave equation. And that wave equation uh, in cartoon form looks like that. It's some sort of um, hyperbolic. Uh, linear wave equation for the perturbations in the black hole background. And um, uh, excuse my Italian, it's called the Reggie-Wheeler equation. 
I apologize for my Reggie. Um, so that, that's tractable. So um, that's an interesting limit, um, and uh, the system uh, certainly lives a fraction of its time in this limit, but it's not the limit I'm going to talk about today because, as I said, I'm a pen and paper guy, and even this problem is not a pen and paper problem. You need Mathematica, so that's beyond my abilities. So uh, the problem that I'm going to focus on for uh, the rest of today and tomorrow is uh, the linear regime where the parameter epsilon is small. So in this limit now, it starts to make sense uh, to introduce a separation between the objects. Um, and um, you can draw a different picture of what the system looks like. It looks a lot cleaner than this thing uh, because now the objects are really far apart and almost point-like. And so we can introduce a new scale, which is a separation between them. That was a question earlier, um, earlier in the lecture. Um, and so these guys are now in some sort of orbit around each other, which is nearly Keplerian. They're still... Uh, that orbit is still unstable, it's still, there's still gravitational wave emission, uh, but um, the wavelength of these gravitational waves is pretty large compared to the other scales in the problem. So now we have uh, multiple scales. We have the size of the object. If there are black holes, it's a gravitational radius, uh, the separation between them, and then uh, there's the wavelength of the radiation that's being emitted. And there's a hierarchy of length scales in the problem. So we have uh, the gravitational radius. That's the smallest scale you can have in classical GR. Uh, and then um, we're assuming that um, there is a, um, a well-defined orbital scale, and it's a lot larger than this thing. And then um, because epsilon, which was just the gravitational radius times uh, the frequency, is... Um, it means that the wavelength of the gravitational waves is much bigger than every other scale in this problem. Um, and in fact, in this problem, um, because the gravitational uh, radius is so much smaller than this thing, uh, we recover Newtonian physics to a good approximation. So, um, for example, we can define a typical velocity. And the velocity squared is... Um, what you would get from Newton's loss, that is the gravitational radius divided by uh, this, the orbital separation. So this is of order r gravity over r. And it's, a and, it's, and it's a small scale in this problem. So now we have, well, this is the expansion parameter, but this is also can be regarded as the expansion parameter. It's a small scale. So what we have here is a nearly Newtonian system. Um, and so we can now hope to do perturbation theory around Newtonian physics, around Newtonian gravity that we understand pretty well. Um, so it's uh, nearly Newtonian orbits, and then if you want to understand the gravitational waves being emitted, you can just do um, linearized gravity around that, that limit. So um, the answer to a really good approximation in this regime, the, the, the dynamics in this regime is described by um, two simple equations. Yes, it is. Uh, that's a good question. I should have said that um, half an hour ago. Uh, so Hulse and Taylor won a Nobel Prize for studying exactly this system. So, so gravitational waves, emit, in their case, it was pairs of neutron stars, separated actually by a much larger scale than the one that's relevant for LIGO. I forgot the exact number, but um, it's exactly a problem of this kind. And if you look at how the orbit decays as a function of time, it's bang on with the GR answer. Um, what else can I say about that? Um, and it's a system that has been, has been tracked for so long, it was discovered in the 70s that you actually need to go uh, to second order 
in the um, in the expansion parameter to understand to, to get the to fit to get the right fit. Uh, so that's really one motivation for studying for my whole talk, which is this is a system that's out there, right? Apart from the fact that it's going to be sort of the bread and butter type signal for uh, gravity wave detectors. So you'll get more about that in the afternoon lectures. Thank you for that question. So anyway, it's a nearly Newtonian system, so we can write down equations to describe its evolution uh, almost immediately. They're textbook equations. Yes? Excuse me? Uh, these are astrophysical objects, so zero. Zero charge, yeah. We're not doing quantum gravity here. They're not extreme old supersymmetric black holes, just plain old Schwarzschild objects, or Kerr objects, I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, nearly Newtonian system. Um, so uh, here are the equations that describe it. A Lagrangian for, they're basically point particles, particle one or black hole one with mass m1, particle two with mass m2 and position x interacting through purely Newtonian gravity. Newton's constant M1, M2 over R. So that describes the orbital evolution to a good approximation, but um, there are corrections to that limit, and I'm going to discuss those corrections in great detail. Um, and then um, the uh, instability, the fact that the system em emits waves, um, it is encoded in a formula that Einstein derived probably 100 years ago, I guess. I think it was in the original paper. Um, and it's the famous uh, quadrupole radiation formula, which says that the rate of change of mechanical energy of the system, <laughs> at least if you average over many orbits, so there's a minus sign, is equal to um, the uh, power emitted in gravitational waves. And the power emitted in gravitational waves it's related to the moment of inertia of this orbiting system um, of point masses. So the actual formula is that it's Newton's constant divided by five. Five is because um, it's a quadrupole, 2L plus one. Um, and then it involves um, the third time derivative of the quadrupole moment squared. And the brackets here just denote a time average, so I'm averaging over many orbits. And uh, this QIJ is just a moment of inertia, but um, it's just a traceless part of the inertia matrix. So uh, QIJ is the sum over the point masses times the coordinate, so one and two, times the coordinate of each point mass. Um, subtract out the trace. And that's uh, what it is. Um, and then we can get some feel for, um, the, for the dynamics just by plugging in a simple orbit. So I'll leave that algebra. So these are all textbook formulas. I got them out of uh, MTW, but they're in every textbook. Well, this one I didn't need to look up in MTW. But, um, so let's just do, uh, for simplicity, circular orbits and just plug in. And then um, the binding energy of the system, the mechanical energy of the system, is just uh, a half mv squared minus, because it's gravitational energy. Um, and uh, the quadrupole formula in that case uh, turns out to be equal to um, 32 divided by 5. Um, and then it goes like velocity of the system to the 10 divided by Newton's constant. Kind of weird, but okay. Uh, and then the reduced mass um, divided by the total mass. 
So um, that's uh, what the system looks like, um, or what the relevant equations are like for a circular orbit. They simplify. Um, and uh, we can solve these equations just by setting um, the rate of change of the mechanical energy to the, um, to the gravitational wave power spectrum, or power, it's not a spectrum yet, um, to understand the dynamics of the system, um, at least crudely. Yes? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's just the conserved energy associated with this Lagrangian. So a half mv squared for each guy minus gm over r. If it's energy? It's not really conserved, right? But right. is that just this energy leaving? Yeah, so we are, we are saying that the total energy is changing because energy is being radiated away. So, yeah, so, so, so it's a bit of a cheat, really, right? It's called the adiabatic approximation. So you, you and it's actually consistent and it can be derived rigorously um, in, in the sense that um, using this, uh, where was it? Just setting this equal to this, okay, it's not really rigorous, but the error is some power of velocity, so it's small in this limit. Thank you. Okay, so uh, um, with that, uh, so that's called the adiabatic approximation when you do that. Uh, anyway, uh, let's use the adiabatic approximation. Let's just assume that it's true. And then let's solve, uh, let's set d by dt of one guy equal to the other guy and see what we get. And when I plug in this formula, I'm going to solve it in terms of um, the frequency. The frequency of the orbit is related simply to the gravitational uh, wave frequency by a factor of two, actually. So the velocity, if this is a Newtonian system, is related to the frequency by this formula. That's called Kepler's law. So the orbital radius and the velocity are fixed in terms of the gravitational radius and the frequency. And if you plug this into these formulas, set the time derivative of this equal to this, you get an equation, uh, and I'm going to omit uh, order one numbers. So I'm going to assume uh, for simplicity that uh, mu is of order m. So these are roughly the same mass objects. So then um, um, set setting e dot equal to minus the power in gravitational waves uh, gives me an equation for how the frequency evolves in time. So this is uh, the, ex the formula that Halston Taylor had to fit to back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And I think they ran out of money. But So this is the equation that we have to solve if we want to know the orbital evolution. And it's a pretty simple equation to solve d omega dt goes like a power of omega. Um, so from this equation, we can understand, um, for, for instance, how long does it take for the orbit to decay? The uh, orbital the time that it takes to decay is uh, just an integral over the frequencies involved. So if it starts out with some initial orbital frequency, um, and then you stop observing it at some final frequency, the amount of time that it takes to evolve from this initial orbital frequency to this final one um, is an integral d omega of dt over d omega. We know dt d omega in terms of omega, so we can just calculate that integral. The only scale in this problem is the gravitational radius. So time in units of c equals 1 goes like the radius. And then uh, the non-trivial dynamics is the power law, because this goes like um, some um, difference of these powers of the frequency. <clears throat> 
So that's the result of doing that integral. And if we plug in some numbers for LIGO uh, that operates very roughly speaking, uh, you'll get more details about LIGO in the afternoon. It operates in a, in a frequency band of order, um, so omega over 2 pi is the initial, it's the lower cutoff on the frequency, is something like 10 hertz. Um, and so it goes between that and something like, let's say, um, 10 to the 4 hertz, maybe closer to 1,000, something like that. So that's the final frequency. And if you plug in numbers into that formula, you know how long it takes for this system to live inside of the um, LIGO uh, band. So it's a signal in the LIGO band, and it scans uh, that frequency band uh, in a period of time that if you plug in numbers, you get um, something like this. And I'm being very schematic here because I'm ignoring all sorts of numerical constants when I do this. But if you actually do it, you get something of order a few minutes. Let's call it 10 minutes. Uh, and it depends on the mass of the system. So in units of the mass of the sun, uh, it goes like this. So um, the system uh, lives for a long time in the, in the, uh, in the, in the LIGO band, for example. Um, and then um, you can also calculate the number of orbital cycles that it spends in that band. And that's just uh, the total phase. So it's just um, the uh, frequency integrated over the time spent. And then you get um, something that goes like, um, well, it's dimensionless. Uh, and it goes like um, omega to the f minus 5 thirds. And if you plug in numbers for LIGO, you get a huge number of orbital cycles, uh, minus 5 thirds as well. So we already get, just from this very crude approximation, um, a lot of information about what the system is doing for typical numbers of experimental relevance. So um, if we start out, I don't know, for instance, with neutron star, neutron star pairs at a frequency of 10 hertz, they're separated by a distance of about 100 kilometers. That follows from Kepler's law. Um, uh, a velocity of order 10 to the minus 2 in um, C equals 1 units. And then um, it speeds up because it's emitting gravitational wa waves, so it's falling into a gravitational potential. And then it, by the time it's at the upper end of the band, uh, the velocity is closer to like a tenth the speed of light. Uh, the radius is right about the actual radius of the object, so that's when they're getting ready to collide. But the point is that for, a, for, a, for basically the entire band, except a small uh, region at the end point, the system really is nearly Newtonian. Um, and so if you're going to set out to discover these sources, um, this is really all the formalism you need, basically. I mean, you have to clean it up a little, but uh, that's about all you need. Um, and that's good enough for discovery. So most of, the, most, of the, um, most of the dynamics is in this Newtonian limit, most. So that's good enough for um, discovery. But once you discovered it and you want to learn about gravitational physics from these systems, you want to extract the masses of the actual black holes, their spins, et cetera, et cetera, you, you have to uh, look at things in more detail. You have to look at corrections to this formula. The experiments actually are sensitive to those corrections uh, because um, the system is coherent uh, over the band of the detector uh, for many cycles. So uh, any tiny deviation um, from, um, from the actual theoretical value um, is um, detectable. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you really want to extract all the parameters, you have to calculate the dynamics to pretty high order in the velocity. Uh, and it was determined uh, in the 90s um, how far can you go and that LIGO is sensitive to. So the fact that the system goes for like uh, 10,000 orbits in the LIGO detector uh, gives you, um, gives you um, 
an estimate of how far do you have to go in perturbative GR corrections away from the Newtonian limit. The answer uh, as worked out in 1994 uh, turns out to be that beyond this leading order Newtonian uh, result over here, you have to go uh, to, um, um, to the following order. Again, this is not for discovery. What we did is already good enough for discovery. But for parameter um, extraction, it turns out that you need um, corrections that are order velocity to the six beyond uh, Newtonian gravity. So you actually have to solve um, the Einstein equations as a perturbative expansion in powers of velocity to a rather high order. Uh, so for example, we would calculate the energy of the system and uh, in the Newtonian limit, we'd get something like this. But then there's GR corrections from uh, the fact that the systems have, um, well, from nonlinear GR or from just retardation effects that Newton's loss, that the interaction is not instantaneous, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an order V squared correction to that. Uh, and then there's an order V to the fourth and an order V to the sixth. So, et cetera. Um, so uh, for the energy, you have to go at least to that order. For the power, you have to go, well, it starts at V to the 10. That's the, the uh, leading order Einstein result. Uh, and then the next term is order velocity squared. The next term turned out to be velocity cubed. I'll, I think I will explain that next, next lecture. Uh, velocity to the fourth. Uh, velocity to the fifth, velocity to the sixth, and it turns out that at velocity to the sixth, you start also finding logarithms of the velocity in the expansion. I will also explain that next lecture. So um, this estimate uh, th that you have to go to this order was worked out by Thorne and his collaborators, um, uh, Finn, Larson, I forget who else, sorry. Uh, I didn't write down the reference, but it's Thorne from 1994 or so. Um, that was the original motivation for going out to this high order. There's a more modern motivation for doing that, which is that um, uh, numerical GR has really, um, I don't know, uh, come into its own in the last decade. Now they can finally really evolve these systems numerically over many orbits. And, it's the, and uh, the new question is, how do you match these the perturbative limit to the, to the numerical results, and that also motivates going out to pretty high order in the expansion. So I'm gonna assume that that's well motivated, and what I'm gonna try to do is construct or tell you how you compute these corrections. Um, but again, if all you care about is discovery, we're done, and then you can go to lunch. But if you wanna hear more stuff, um, stick around. Um, by the way, the, um, the uh, activity of computing uh, these sort of corrections is called the post-Newtonian expansion. In GR, it has its roots with uh, the work of Einstein himself, who worked out some of these corrections in his original paper and later on as well. Um, and then it really took off in the 80s and 90s, motivated really by gravitational wave detection. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk about in, the, in these lectures is basically the post-Newtonian expansion, but rephrased in a sort of modern particle physics language, because I, I would like to convince you that that's a useful thing to do. The reason why that's a useful thing to do why use uh, these sort of fancy particle physics methods to address this problem, which is just basically the problem of solving Einstein's equations order by order in perturbation theory. That's all we're doing, really. Uh, but there is a good reason why uh, one should think about this in a different light. Um, and it's because the problem involves a hierarchy of length scales. 
So at a given order in velocity, we have effects coming in from um, three different, um, different scales. And they're completely different physical effects. Uh, once again, the physical scales are the actual radius of the object. So the physics associated with whatever sets that radius for a neutron star, for example, um, that comes into play here. So that's of order of the gravitational radius. There is, uh, in this limit, a well-defined orbital scale. And there's physics associated with the orbital dynamics. And finally, there is the wavelength of the gravitational radiation itself. These are all scales that play a role in this problem, and they're all correlated by the kinematics. The kinematics tells us, for example, that if you take the ratio of the gravitational radius over the orbital radius by uh, Kepler's law, that's v squared. So um, the expansion parameter v, much less than 1, is related to a ratio of scales, but um, it's also related by the multiple expansion to the ratio of the gravitational wave scale over the radius. That's of order v. Again, much less than 1. So if we want to compute at a given order and velocity, uh, we have effects coming from all these different scales in the problem. And the question is, how do we organize that? How do we think about how to do that efficiently? And uh, now I come to the subject of, well, the main subject of, of these talks. And it's how to actually do this, how to organize this stuff in an in a, in a, in efficient way. Um, and there is a set of methods for doing that, and it's called um, effective field theory. So what I would like to do for the remaining time I have is set up this problem, which I just described, using this uh, effective field theory language. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. So yeah, so correlated scales means that it's useful to use the language of effective field theory. And so now I'm going to uh, spend some time giving you a uh, sort of schematic um, introduction to the ideas of effective field theory. Um, and then uh, I'm going to fill in sort of my sketchy introduction here with examples drawn from this system as we go on. So I will just assert a, a bunch of things that are true, and uh, either you already know them, um, in which case you don't need this, or uh, this is new to you, in which case um, you'll have to take my word. But uh, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, because there's people with many different backgrounds here, um, I'd like to um, tell you what the ideas involved are. And then we can apply them. So whenever I say effective field theory, I'm going to abbreviate it by EFT. And I'm going to be schematic here. Um, and uh, before I get started, uh, for my own sanity, um, just because it's what I'm used to, I'm going to use units in which, even though there's no Planck's constant anywhere in what I do, I'm going to set it to 1. And I'm going to set the speed of light to 1. And I'm not going to go all out and set uh, Newton's constant to 1. I'm not doing quantum gravity here. Um, that means that um, everything has units of mass to a power. Um, so anything goes like um, mass to some power. In particular, Newton's constant goes like uh, 1 over mass squared. Uh, and in my system of units, um, it is equal to 1 over 32 pi m Planck squared. So those are the units. Um, Anything goes like mass or energy to a power. Um, and um, if there is, a, I don't know, a, a mantra to the effective field theory idea, 
is the concept of um, scale separation. The reason why you do effective field theory is because it allows you to separate scales explicitly. So I'm, I'm going to explain why that works. So it's called scale separation, but it's also called decoupling. So to illustrate what decoupling means, I'm going to consider a schematic field theory, classical or quantum. Even though I'm going to be using quantum language, um, everything I do applies to the classical case as well, as we will see. And so to illustrate the idea, I'm going to consider a model where I have some fields, like the gravitational field, for example, or the electromagnetic field. And some of them are what I'm going to call heavy, and some of them are going to, are going to be what I call light. So I have some sort of field theory. It's described by a Lagrangian containing two types of fields, which I'm going to call phi and phi, um, for clarity. <laughs> Little phi and big phi. It involves some sort of Lagrangian. Let's call this thing the full theory. So this is our universe. It describes everything. That's why it's called the full theory. But I'm going to imagine that um, these fields are such that uh, big phi is very massive, for example. So it describes, in a quantum field theory, particles of mass, big M. And little phi is light. So little phi of x is what I'm going to call the light fields, meaning that the mass of phi um, is uh, small. In fact, it's probably going to be even zero. So like a photon or a graviton. Um, and then the second set of objects, big phi, are very heavy. So uh, this m phi has a mass which is certainly much bigger than the mass of the light guys. And sometimes I'm going to call this mass um, lambda, big lambda, as units of mass or energy. And we're going to call this quantity the ultraviolet cutoff. This lambda, or the mass of the big phi, is uh, the biggest energy scale in this problem or the shortest distance scale in this problem. So it's called the UV scale, UV ultraviolet short distances. So um, this is the system. It's described by some Lagrangian. It has two types of fields in it. And um, in this toy universe, we have an LHC, which um, has enough energy to make the light particles, like the standard model, for example, and the Higgs. But um, it has not enough energy to make any new, any heavy particles. We haven't seen any. We think, we hope there's some, but um, I don't know. It's not looking so great these days. But anyway, um, let's pretend that they're still there and ask what happens. So we're going to be doing some sort of experiment, like a collider experiment. And the energy scales of that experiment, let's call that energy scale omega, it's uh, going to be of order or less, actually, or greater than the mass of uh, the light particles, but it's certainly going to be much less than the mass of the big heavy particles. Um, so that's the kinematic situation we're in. We have the theory of everything, so we can calculate whatever we want using this theory. But um, it seems kind of natural because we don't have direct kinematic access to the heavy fields. We can't make them um, to, sort, to try to remove them from the physics because experimentalists that are doing physics at this energy scale don't know anything about these heavy particles. Um, the theorists in this, true, in this toy world know everything, 
there's some string theorists, and they use anomaly cancellation to figure out the Lagrangian, something like that. Uh, but the experimentalists are not so sure that the string theorists are right. So, so they still have to build an LHC. So um, if you want to make predictions for this experiment, it doesn't make a lot of sense to carry this big phi around since you don't make it directly. So instead, we're going to be doing something which is called, uh, in the language of effective field theory, uh, integrating out. Literally, what that means is that um, in this field theory, there is a quantity which generates all the observables that symbolically I can write as a path integral uh, over, the over the heavy fields and over the light fields. So you use your favorite method for computing this path integral. If the theory is weakly coupled, you can use Feynman diagrams. Otherwise, you have to put it on a computer. Um, whichever way um, we do the calculation, um, it makes sense to um, do the integral sequentially. First, we do it over the heavy fields, and then we do it over the light fields. Um, and the reason why this is useful is because of this decoupling concept. So let me uh, try to explain that. So we'll do the integral sequentially. meaning that we'll first do the integral over the heavy stuff, weighted by the action. And then since we're integrating over the big phi, all that's left is some function of the little phi. Let's call that quantity um, S effective of little phi. And effective uh, means that this is what we call an effective action. Okay, And here's where decoupling comes in. The reason why it's useful to do this is because um, this effective action and its associated effective Lagrangian can be written in a very simple form. So here's what decoupling means. So there's some effective Lagrangian for the light fields. And what decoupling means is that uh, this effective Lagrangian can be written in a local way, meaning that it has the following form. So it's a local function, local meaning that it's, in other words, just a function of phi at x. So this is a, the Lagrangian itself is a function of x because we're integrating over x to get the action. And uh, what decoupling means is that you can always write this uh, Lagrangian as a local function of the light fields and their derivatives. So it is a sum over many terms. In general, an infinite number of terms um, indexed by some index. And then it involves a bunch of what are called coupling constants. Um, and then a bunch of, as I said, local terms. So these are just functions of um, phi at x and then derivative of phi at x. That's what decoupling is. Um, the first person to make a big deal out of this observation um, is um, Wilson, um, and he did this in the 1970s, trying to understand both the strong interactions, uh, QCD, well, pre-QCD, trying to understand the strong interactions, uh, 
and also trying to understand critical phenomena in statistical mechanics. He found that this language, this decoupling language, this um, idea of integrating out heavy degrees of freedom was very useful um, because of this. And so I'm going to explain to you why this is a useful uh, observation. These coupling constants, uh, I'm going to assume that it was not Wilson who gave him this name, uh, but you never know, are called uh, Wilson coefficients. They're just coupling constants. The beauty is that, um, let's ignore the mass of the little phi, so it's zero. The beauty is that um, they're complete, well, not completely, but they're largely determined by dimensional analysis. That's um, one of the nice things that um, decoupling tells you. Because uh, there's two scales, in, well, there's really, yeah, there's two scales in the problem, the energy, omega, and the, and the mass of the, of the phi particle. The energy omega shows up in the derivatives of the phi fields. Um, the heavy scale, though, has been removed, right? The, the heavy field is no longer there. So um, the, I don't know, the remnant of that scale is in the coupling constants of this low energy theory, of this effective theory. And we can just do dimensional analysis to figure out um, how they scale. Yes? You, you mind speaking a little louder? I can't hear you. No, it, in the general Lagrangian, I assume they can interact in any way I like. So that's the magic of decoupling, that I have to make very few assumptions about the form of the full theory. And whatever happens at low energies is of the form that I write down. That, that, that's, I'm not proving that to you, it's, that's, that, but that's the, the main conceptual thing. And we'll see examples in the context of the binary system. Not till tomorrow, I guess. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, Wilson coefficients, we can do dimensional analysis. Everything has units of energy to some power. The action is dimensionless as units of h bar, as units of angular momentum. So uh, it goes like mass to the zeroth power. Um, therefore, uh, the Lagrangian, because uh, position has units of one over momentum, so one over energy. Therefore, the Lagrangian has to have, in four spacetime dimensions, units of mass to the four. So any term in this uh, Lagrangian has to have uh, units of mass of the four. Now let's assume that um, this uh, term, this O, which is something that you build out of the phi's and their derivatives and so on, has uh, dimensions to some power, um, let's call it delta. So this is some dimensionless number. So now we know the units of uh, the coupling constant. So this is mass of the delta, this is mass of the fourth, so C has to have units of mass to the four minus delta. Um, it has units of mass. There's only one scale in this problem, which is the heavy mass, one explicit scale, the, the light scale is in the phi field. So uh, whatever this coefficient is has to um, scale like some dimensionless, let's call it equal, some dimensionless parameter divided by um, the scale uh, delta to the minus four, divided by this UV scale delta to the minus four. So that's what decoupling means, that whatever happens in the UV, whatever the full theory looks like, the effective field theory for just the phi is very simple. 
In other words, the effects of um, short distance physics on light stuff, it's pretty mild. Um, it, there's only two possibilities. It either, um, and it depends on uh, how big this delta is. The critical number is four. So delta is either bigger or less than four. Or equal to four. Terms with um, delta less than or equal to four are what are called um, uh, relevant terms. Um, terms with uh, delta bigger than four are what are called irrelevant. They're not irrelevant in the sense that uh, you can just throw them away. They're irrelevant in the sense that um, they become small at low energies because we can just do dimensional analysis to try to understand the effects of one of these terms. So let's call this delta i. So the effects of oi will therefore scale like omega over, la over the scale lambda to some power. And the power is the one that's given by dimensional analysis, delta to the minus 4. So if delta is bigger than 4, um, then this is tiny. And you can ignore it. If, uh, if uh, delta is bigger than or equal to 4, you cannot ignore it. So it's relevant. But it's a term that was probably already there in the original Lagrangian, maybe modified by the interactions. So the effects of the UV, of the short distance physics, are, as I said, very mild. Either they just generate terms that were already there, so they just redefine the low energy parameters of, of the phi field, like its mass or its kinetic energy or something like that. Or they just generate these new terms, these terms that are very small. And that's the concept of decoupling. It's useful because it tells us that um, we can organize um, calculations in, uh, in terms of the dimensions of the terms in the Lagrangian. So the terms in the Lagrangian get more and more complicated as you include higher and higher dimensional terms. They have more derivatives on the fields. There's more of them, et cetera. Uh, but um, at a given order in this expansion, they get smaller and smaller, so you can hope to truncate them. This is especially true um, given the fact that um, every experiment um, has some sort of experimental error or has some sort of resolution. Let's call that epsilon. And it's uh, hopefully less than one. But the experiment is good. And so therefore, we only have to keep terms um, up to a given order in this uh, dimension expansion, up to some maximum dimension. So um, even though the expansion in operators or terms uh, is an infinite expansion, um, you only have to keep a finite number of terms. So, uh, not, not delta less than four, le delta less than this delta max. Because if you keep more, there's no point unless you build a better experiment. So, it's all f it really follows from dimensional analysis together with this highly non-trivial fact uh, which uh, won this guy a Nobel Prize. Uh, what else can I say about this? So, um, so, uh, so the, these theories have predictive power because we know that uh, we always have experimental resolution that is finite. So predictive power is there because really only a finite number of terms are needed, the number of terms being de dependent by the experiment. So that's the basic fact, and I hope to give you examples in the context of the binary system. Um, I guess probably not till tomorrow. Um, but now the question is, how do you use this fact? And I can think of two ways of using this information. Depending on whether you're a string theorist and you know the full theory, or you're just uh, like myself, a lowly particle phenomenologist, and you're more agnostic. Uh, 
So um, how do we use this information? Well, let's first of all, one way of using it is to say that we actually know the full theory. Then um, you can certainly, you're free to calculate uh, using the full Lagrangian, but um, that might be complicated and painful, and it might just be simpler to remove the large scales in the problem uh, in this way that I mentioned first, and then do calculations in the low energy theory. So what, um, this, uh, what this concept, what this decoupling idea, or what this effective field theory idea, in this case, it's just a way of organizing um, an expansion, a systematic expansion, in powers of ratios of scales. So it's, it's a bookkeeping device, if you like. But it's a useful bookkeeping device. And it organizes an expansion in powers of the observable energy scale, the scale of the experiment, um, divided by the short distance scale, lambda. So, sorry, say that again. I, so this is like if the d degrees of freedom are still the same? So, so it's, it's the case where um, it's like the LHC before the Higgs. So we kind of know that it's going to be there, but um, we haven't made it. So why should we keep it in our theory? We should remove it. But we can't really get like ions from, can you, can you get ions? Uh, from you, you, in principle, you can get them by integrating out. But in practice, you do something else. So that's actually going to be more my second example. So I'll, I'll say a few words about that. You, you're consistently a little ahead of me in these lectures. <laughs> so it's a bookkeeping device. It's a really useful bookkeeping device because it doesn't just tell you about the powers of omega over lambda. It also tells you about non-analytic dependence on omega over lambda. That's because um, what I haven't told you so far, and um, maybe it's a slightly more technical than I need to be, these uh, coefficients obey what are called renormalization group equations. They depend on a renormalization scale that you need whenever you start doing uh, radiative corrections in any field theory. So um, the bookkeeping that I mentioned coupled uh, with something called the renormalization group um, which means that uh, the coefficients here actually depend on an arbitrary renormalization scale that you need in order to make sense of loop diagrams, Feynman diagrams, um, it's a function of mu. It's a function of some scale, renormalization scale. It's not a physical scale. It's a theorist scale that you use to do calculations. And so uh, these parameters evolve together according to renormalization group equations that you can calculate in the effective theory. And they look just like, um, I don't know, equations for a particle moving on some space. So if you solve these equations, uh, they depend on initial conditions. Uh, a nice place to set initial conditions is at the large scale. And that's where you set initial conditions, where these parameters are typically of order one. Um, order one, not one. Um, and then um, evolve using these equations 
down to a scale of order, the physical scale that you're interested in. And when you do that, you get logarithms. So if you know the effective theory, if you know the full theory, it's still useful to do effective field theory because by solving some pretty simple renormalization group equations, I hope to give an example of one uh, again next, uh, tomorrow, you can get um, logarithmic dependence on the ratio of scales as well. So a typical observable using this um, glorified dimensional analysis, this decoupling, together with uh, the renormalization group, the prediction is that a typical observable is going to scale like powers of this ratio times powers of logarithms uh, of the same ratio. And the renormalization group tells you exactly what those logarithms are and exactly what those coefficients are. So doing that is a lot easier than doing calculations um, in the full theory where you have all sorts of scales in the perturbative expansion um, and it's a big mess. So another way of describing what I just said is that um, this bookkeeping procedure views the full theory uh, in, in a, as a sequence of uh, effective theories, which are easier to deal with. So uh, the picture is that we have a full theory, for example, uh, let's imagine a full theory where you have um, two uh, heavy fields, phi one and phi two, and a light field. Um, and then what you do, instead of calculating with that big mess with all sorts of particles with different masses, it's you just integrate out uh, each one at a time. So you first integrate out the heaviest one, let's call that phi one, um, and then you just do renormalization group evolution um, in an effective theory that just contains the light fields, which relative to phi one are big phi two and little phi. And you do that until you hit uh, another threshold, which is the mass of um, the second heavy guy. So from the point of view of this theory, this guy is light. But once you get to low enough energies, it's no longer light. So why keep it around? So it's a good idea to just remove it by hand. Uh, removing it by hand is what I just did before, this thing of integrating out. It's also called matching. So that's a buzzword that I will use from time to time. And then um, you run down again using the renormalization group equations uh, in an effective field theory that now no longer contains this, just contains the light stuff. And then you keep going um, all the way till you get to the scale of the problem you're interested in. So this cartoon is how effective field theory handles calculations. Um, the prototypical example of that um, is, um, is uh, the weak interactions in particle physics. The weak interactions, as, um, as, um, as uh, Salam and Weinberg and Glashow pointed out, are mediated by a charged heavy spin one particle called the W boson. And uh, a typical weak interaction process Um, a leading order involves the exchange of the W boson. So here on the external lines are some fermions, doesn't matter for my purposes. There's some order one coupling constant here associated with the weak interactions. Uh, but now let me imagine that I have, um, that I'm doing experiments at momentum transfers Q, which are much smaller than the mass of the W. And the mass of the W is about 80 GeV. It's known to like four digits, five digits, uh, but uh, let's just say it's 80. So uh, this is the full theory. It contains light particles like fermions, and it contains heavy particles like the W boson. But, um, um, but um, at low energies, it makes a lot more sense to just uh, remove that particle because its effects look just like a local interaction 
between the light particles with an effective coupling constant known as G Fermi, which is of order G squared divided by the mass of the W squared. Uh, Fermi didn't know about the W boson. Nevertheless, he actually knew about the scale because what he did is he didn't know the full theory. He knew the effective theory. And he just uh, used it to compute things and computed this parameter and found it to be roughly uh, 1 over 250 GeV squared. Um, so um, he could have figured out the standard model. Not really. Um, anyway, um, so that's, um, that's uh, the sort of prototypical example of an effective field theory. And you might say, so what? This diagram is not that complicated, so what do I need to go through all this trouble for? The answer is that if you want to do radiative corrections, um, it's a lot easier to do them in the effective theory than it is in the full theory, um, at least at energies um, smaller than the W mass. So if you were going to do the radiative corrections in the full theory, you would have to compute Feynman diagrams involving W boson exchange, and then exchange of, um, let's say these are quarks. You would have the exchange of what's called a gluon, a massless particle. And so these are the sort of diagrams that you would have to calculate. Um, but as was actually first pointed out by uh, Witten in the 1970s, uh, it's stupid to calculate these box diagrams because you can just do them in the effective theory and uh, get answers. Same answers, you have to get the same answers, but uh, a lot easier. So this, this calculation is a calculation that involves uh, all sorts of stuff. It involves the masses of the light quarks. It involves the, masses, the mass of the W, et cetera. And it's a, you have to calculate some box diagram. It's not the end of the world, but it's not something that um, I particularly like doing. However, in the effective theory, where you remove the uh, W boson, it's a lot cleaner. All you have to do is uh, calculate diagrams that look like this, where you have gluon exchange. Um, and it is an easier thing to do. So that's sort of the canonical example. Um, and certainly, the kind of effective field theory that I'm going to use for the binary problem is going to be, it's going to use effective field theory in this sense. Um, it's also going to use effective field theory in the following sense. So the second way of using effective field theory is what happens if you do not know the full theory. So we don't know what quantum gravity is, for example. Um, nevertheless, we can still make progress because the effects of quantum gravity decouple. If, quant if the full theory is not known, and you only know the light particles, because those are the only particles that you made at an accelerator, for example, um, you can still use uh, this concept to uh, try to understand the effects of unknown um, heavy physics, short distance physics. Because decoupling guarantees that whatever the effects of the UV scale, they have to show up as local terms in some effective Lagrangian um, involving just the light fields. Um, so the Lagrangian would just look like the stuff that we wrote down earlier today just involving these local terms. So it's a way of parametrizing ignorance order by order in a, a ratio of scales. That's why it's so useful. Um, given the experimental resolution is finite, I only need to keep a finite number of unknown terms and fit them to data. And this is particularly useful when there are symmetries in the problem that constrain the form of the, of the Lagrangian. So it's useful because um, it's a way of parametrizing ignorance. Um, and uh, so I'll write that. <laughs> 
in a systematic order by order in the expansion parameter way. And it's most useful and it's most of the time used um, if the low energy dynamics has some known symmetries associated with it because then you can use the symmetries to constrain the parameters. Uh, not, the, not the coefficients themselves, but the, the operators, the terms in the Lagrangian. I will also use effective field theory in this language. I guess I'm almost out of time today. Um, so I'll just give you examples of um, this second way of doing effective field theory. I'm pretty hungry, so after that I will stop and go eat. I don't know what you guys are going to do. So um, I guess one typical example, one good example is um, classical GR. I do not know what quantum gravity is, but I know that um, whatever new degrees of freedom it has probably live at the Planck scale. So if I'm interested in, I don't know, doing graviton-graviton scattering at low energies, meaning much smaller than the scale M Planck, 10 to the 19 GeV, I can do so in an effective field theory that just includes gravity. It just includes the graviton. So in this case, what I call the light degree of freedom is just the metric, g mu nu of x. So it corresponds to a massless particle, mass equal to zero, called the graviton. And then you can, without knowing everything there is to know about quantum gravity, write down an effective Lagrangian for that field by itself. Um, the guide to doing so are the symmetries of the problem. Because what Einstein told us 100 years ago is that um, there's something called the equivalence principle. And it can be interpreted as something called diffeomorphism invariance, which, OK, if you're going to be a stickler, it's not really a symmetry. But let's view it as a symmetry. Um, and so this low energy dynamics um, has um, the following symmetry. I can take the coordinates and change them at will, any way I like. Uh, this metric transforms in some prescribed way. And so then you can start writing down the most general Lagrangian for um, the effective field theory based on the symmetries. So the simplest term that you would write down um, would have some sort of, um, would have no derivatives on the field. That term is the cosmological constant term. Then the next simplest term you would write down um, the symmetries tell you that it's got to go like um, the curvature linearly, and it's got some coefficient. Let's call it the Planck scale itself, because that's what it has to be by dimensional analysis. And then you could keep going and add uh, R squared terms. And now these involve, actually, these guys don't have a scale. But if you go to R cubed, you get a 1 over M Planck squared, et cetera, et cetera. And so at very low energies, what survives are just these terms. And uh, indeed, pretty much every lecture, I think every lecture that you'll have will involve these terms in some way. So that's one way in which um, effective field theory is used. If you don't know the full theory, you can constrain the low energy physics in a model independent way and systematically parameterize deviations. Uh, the second example is the standard model itself because we know all the particles in the standard model by now, and we know their symmetries. Uh, but we hope that there's some sort of UV physics uh, near, um, near the TeV scale. I still hold out hope, keep the hope alive. But what constrains that theory is a symmetry called the SU3 times SU2 times U1. And so the Lagrangian. Um, has a bunch of terms with dimension four, which are in every textbook, like Peskin and Schroeder, involving uh, quarks, leptons, gluons, Zs, Ws, photons, etc. 
Um, and then it has terms with uh, dimension six, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And then this scale uh, experiments constrain it to be by now something of order 10 TeV. So even if I don't know what's happening at 10 TeV, I can put this into the Lagrangian and put constraints on it based on low energy data. That's called precision electroweak physics. Um, and uh, I guess uh, since I'm hungry, um, I'll do one last example. I was going to talk about QCD, but I'm too hungry. So uh, the last example I will give is of, um, condensed, of condensed matter systems. They also use effective field theory precisely in this way. At short distances, they might have some complicated crystal or a fluid or, or sorry, a, a, yeah, a complicated crystal or a, a system of interacting many body uh, atoms or something, many atoms or something like that. Um, but um, at, low, uh, at low frequencies, you can write down an effective Lagrangian for the low energy degrees of freedom. Uh, an example, so this is a condensed matter, and uh, an example that I like of effective field theories of this sort are the effective field theory for um, fluids um, that were written down by uh, Nicolas and his collaborators starting uh, in 2005, I think it was, and they've been actively, is that right, 2005? Uh, six, and uh, till now they've been working out the consequences. So that's a very beautiful example of an effective field theory. So uh, I think I'm out of time, is that right? Yep, uh, I'm starving, so um, I think that's all I will say for now. I, I can answer some questions if there are any. If not, I'll continue next tomorrow. I guess Walter wants to go to lunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know can. if I made that clear yet or not. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's possible to have lunch either at the cafeteria here or the bar upstairs or even the cafeteria down uh, at Adriatico, which uh, is, is also open. Okay, let's thank Walter for this beautiful thank lecture. You.